welcome back. So, uh, let us continue from where we left off, but before we do that a quick recap uh, about yield curves which we did in the last uh, lecture yesterday. Uh, we have three types of yield curves, you have the spot yield curve which plots the uh, spot yields that is the yield on 0 coupon bonds against the respective maturities of the bonds. Uh, then we also have uh, a yield curve which can be based on coupon bonds which where we plot the YTM of the coupon bonds against the maturities of the relevant bonds. Uh, we have the par yield curve which is a plot of par yields, what are par yields? These are yields uh, which are uh, yields on bond bonds which are quoted at par. In other words, uh, they are the coupon rates uh, which uh, when the bond as, is ascribed those coupon rates would yield a par value of the bond. But because in the case of the par value the coupon rates and the uh, YTMs coincide and therefore, we can also uh, define the par bonds in terms of YTMs of bonds quoted at par uh, or we can define them in terms of the coupon rates of bonds which are quoted at par. The formula for the uh, par bond yield, yields is given on the slide. Um, we have the coupon rates which are the unknown quantities and we use the respective spot rates corresponding to various maturities and we arrive at the uh, coupon rate which, co which corresponds to the bonds quoting at par or the bond price being at par value. Then we also have forward rates and uh, I discussed this in a lot of detail. We arrived at a relationship between the forward rates and the spot rates uh, on no arbitrage considerations which are given in this slide. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, we can also have a forward rate yield curve which uh, plots the uh, for forward rates for uh, a given maturity say a one year maturity uh, for different annual periods in the future. Like uh, if that uh, one year loan starts at T equal to one year and ends at T equal to two year what rate you will get. Then the if the loan starts at two, uh, T equal to two years ends at T equal to three years what rate would you get that is plotted as a, uh, as a two dimensional graph and that is the forward rate yield curve. Then we talked about yield spreads, yield spreads are represented as the difference between the yields of two different bonds. Uh, they uh, commonly we have a benchmark yield where one of the bonds, uh, the basic bond constitutes the benchmark, it may be a triple A rated bond or it may be a government bond and we try to uh, value or e evaluate the yield spread of our given bond which is of a given uh, credit rating and on that basis we arrive at a differential yield that is uh, ascribed to the riskiness of the bond. A yield where the benchmark yield is the government is the yield on government bonds is called the G spread. Now, the utility of the yield, the yield spread well uh, we know that the yields of uh, bonds depends on the riskiness of the bond and uh, the change in yield may be ascribed to two factors the macroeconomic factors macroeconomic uh, changes in yield, uh, changes which uh, cause a change in the yield of our instrument or there may be singular factors which are specific to the uh, to the yield of our given instrument like a change in the credit rating of the instrument now if the yield spread remains the same and there is an increase in the yield on our instrument we need not worry too much because that would be due to the macroeconomic factors. The yield spread is constant which shows that across the spectrum of uh, various instruments the yield has increased. Whereas, uh, if there is an increase in the yield spread and an increase in yield then we need to worry because an increase in yield spread means that the market perception of the risk of that particular instrument has changed and uh, that could be a cause for worry for the investor. Then we have zero vol volatility spreads. Now, so far whatever uh, curves that I have been talking about are primarily based on YTMs. Uh, the yield spreads that we have worked out on the basis of uh, certain benchmark uh, uh, yields or government yields are based on the YTMs of the various bonds, the YTM of a given bond versus the YTM of the corresponding um, um, government bond or the corresponding benchmark bond. Uh, the, in other words, these yield spreads do not take into account the, uh, the curvature 
of the of the yield curve of the spot yield curve the, it does not account for the curvature of the spot yield curve it does not account for the possibility of the differentials in spot rates corresponding to different maturities so in order to evolve a process whereby this this uh, phenomenon is accommodated in the yield spread we evolve what is called the z spread what we do in the z spread is given in this formula right at the bottom of this slide we add a certain specific a certain constant to each of the uh, spot rates constituting the spectrum of spot rates uh, which are relevant for evaluating a particular bond each of the spot rates are uh, uh, added by a constant now please note the spot rates that are considered here are the benchmark spot rates so this for example the spot rates that are related to the evaluation of a government bond or or the or our benchmark bond triple a rated bond whatever the case may be we add a certain constant to each of these as s zero t's and then we evaluate the price of uh, evaluate the uh, discount the cash flows on the bond and equate the present value of all the future cash flows to the current market price remember it is the current market price not the par value not the par value is the current market price so on the right hand side we have the current market price on the left hand uh, on the left hand side we have the current market price i'm sorry and on the right hand side we have the present value of all future cash flows discounted at a rate which is the relevant spot rate for the uh, benchmark bond plus a certain constant and this gives us an expression or an equation uh, in one unknown which is that constant number on solving this equation we can arrive at the value of that constant which is delta in this particular equation and by using this val value of delta we get the appropriate spread which accommodates or which also accounts for the curvature of the yield curve then we talked about option adjusted uh, spreads uh, certain bonds may have embedded option features uh, in them like uh, bonds which are callable at the instance of the issuer on terms which are already specified in the issue documents or we also may have putable bonds in which case the the bonds are uh, can be sold back to the company at the instance of the investor on terms which are contained again in the issue document so the option adjusted spread based on the bond which does not have that option feature embedded in them in other words what we do is we work out the z spread on the bond on the option bond which uh, with the uh, option uh, in place or with the option structure in place we work out the z spread and from this we subtract the value of the bond if the option was not there uh, this gives us the value of the option let me repeat as this is slightly technical you see we have three quantities we have the option or, or we have the bond with the option which uh, for which let us say we calculate the z spread then we have the bond without the option feature we will have a certain uh, sp uh, spread for that particular bond and then this is relevant to the bond without the option feature or with excluding the option feature is called the option adjusted spread and then of course we have the yield on the government bond or the benchmark bond at the case may be so Uh, uh, let us take an example to illustrate what i am saying uh, for just a moment uh, for a callable bond uh, the yield demanded by the investor would be higher if the option is a part of the bond in other words if the uh, if we evaluate the yield for the bond with the option that is the z spread the uh, the the Uh, yield would be higher this uh, yield required by the bond holders or the investors would be higher because the callability feature operates to the benefit of the issuer of the bond not to the investor of the bond the issuer can buy back the bond according to the terms of the issue so if the uh, so because of this additional feature that operates to the benefit of the issuer uh, the option adjust and uh, the and the uh, yield on this bond a callable bond would be more than the yield on a corresponding bond without the option feature 
which is called the option adjusted spread. So, z spread minus the option adjusted spread will give you the value of the option z spread minus option adjusted spread. Option adjusted spread I repeat is the spread corresponding to the bond with the option feature delinked from the bond and the z spread is the yield on the bond with the option feature in place. So, if you uh, if you subtract the two you get the value of the option. And for example, if a callable bond has the z spread of 180 basis points and the value of the call option is 60 basis points, then the option adjusted spread is 120 basis points. Then we moved on to equity valuation and we uh, in considered the following methods of equity valuation, uh, cash flow based methods, the DCF methods, uh, income based methods, asset based methods using comparables and finally, the option based methods. Our primary focus in this particular uh, course would be on the uh, DCF based methods which are the methods of choice in most cases, although the other methods become significant in singular situations which we shall also discuss. So, let us continue with the cash flow based methods, but before that I also enumerated the features that set out uh, set apart the equity valuation from the uh, bond valuation that we have been discussing so far. Firstly, the cash flows on the equity on holdings in equity shares of a company are non, non discretionary, I am sorry non contractual uh, cash flows on uh, bonds are contractual, they are embodied in the bond indenture, bond contract the interest rates, face values and so on. In the case of uh, equity shares, the, um, the cash flows are discretionary on the uh, uh, resting uh, on the uh, on the company in general meeting which has the discretion to make the uh, de declare the dividends or otherwise retain the profits for future use in the company. Um, then equity takes the substantive businesses which is much more difficult to quantify compared to the creditors faced by lenders for assessing of the credit risk we can always have recourse to credit ratings by reputed agencies which provide us certain guidelines, certain guidance about the riskiness of a debt security and accordingly enable us to arrive at some rationality in uh, working out the discount rate for working the intrinsic value of the instrument. However, because the equity shareholders run the business risk of the company, they take the substantive business risk um, which is much more difficult to quantify and which is much more difficult to encode in a single number which shall form the premise of discounting the equity cash flows. Going concern concept I explained in the last lecture, we need to have this concept in place so that the assets and liabilities of companies uh, across the board may be evaluated on a consistent basis. Uh, uh, in the absence of this going concern concept, the valuations may differ significantly from company to company of similar assets and which may provide uh, difficulty in uh, forming any kind of comparative opinions. So, uh, then there, there was the issue because of the existence of the go going concern concept, we have the problem with us of, of uh, uh, summing up a infinite series of cash flows or uh, uh, discounting an infinite series of cash flows and that involves that implies that it becomes absolutely necessary unavoidable uh, to impute a certain pattern to these cash flows uh, and uh, um, to enable summability of these cash flows and arrive at a finite figure as the sum of these cash flows. So, that is a practical necessity um, besides uh, having some theoretical uh, ration rational basis that we shall discuss soon. Then, uh, but the saving grace is that as we move into the future while the estimation becomes distorted, estimation becomes blurred, uh, it is also true that the distant cash flows contribute lesser and lesser to the present value of the total cash flows. Why DCF is the me method of choice? Well, there are reasons for this. The DCF method is more uh, amenable to time value of money uh, compared to income. Uh, the DCF method represents the current purchasing power of the uh, of the uh, uh, cash flow or of the uh, company rather than uh, a fictional a notional figure which appears purely on the balance sheet. Uh, in, in actual fact, if you look carefully what does profit and loss account or the reserves uh, surplus account represent on a balance sheet, it is simply a notional difference between the 
physical manifestations of assets and the corresponding set of liabilities and the uh, owner's equity. Whatever is the difference between the total of these figures manifests itself as, a, uh, as the reserves and surplus or the profit component uh, in the balance sheet. So, what I want to convey by this, the message that I want to convey is that profits are a notional figure, the profits do not have any physical existence unlike cash flows. Cash flows are physical existence, cash flows uh, are, are sums of money that, that get transferred from uh, one uh, party to another. Uh, or sums of money that may be available for transfer, available for exchange against goods, against services, against uh, um, capital items, whatever the case may be. But the important thing is, it is the cash flow, it is the cash balance that will enable you to, um, to invest, to buy something in the mind. Profits may not be the, uh, the, you know, the physical manifestation which would enable us to make investments. And uh, thirdly, uh, cash flows being physical items and uh, they do are less susceptible, they are less susceptible to accounting policies and, de and uh, ambiguous uh, accounting treatments uh, like the case of depreciation and other uh, several other cases that I alluded to in the last lecture. Now, we talk about the cash flow based methods. Uh, we have two fundamental cash flow based methods. We have the dividend discount models and we have the free cash flow based models. And the choice of the dividend discount model, when, can, when should we use the dividend discount model? Well, if the company has a consistent uh, history of dividend payments, then obviously we can use the dividend discount model. Uh, if it has a consistent history of dividend payments and the dividend policy is clear and related to the earnings of the firm, then the perspective, this is an important point, the perspective or the party who is doing the valuation, the analyst who is doing the valuation, the investor who is doing the valuation is, is a small investor who cannot uh, influence in any to any significant degree the dividend policy of the company. This is important. Uh, the perspective of the party who is doing the valuation, if he is using the dividend discount mo uh, model should be that of a small investor. An investor who has marginal say, an extremely marginal say in the affairs of the company, particularly in so far as declaration of dividend is concerned. So, he will take whatever is given to him, that is the important thing. Uh, he cannot he cannot decide on what is to be given to him, he will take only whatever is given to him. So, that is the perspective from which the dividend valuation is appropriate and the firm is a, is a major, is, a, in, is in the mature state of the industry. So, if these features exist, then uh, we can use the dividend discount model without much uh, distortion for the valuation of equity. Now, the choice of the free cash flow based models, free cash flow based models, well, it, the important thing is here the perspective shifts. Why the perspective sh shifts? Uh, you will see gradually as we move along this presentation. Uh, the important thing is that uh, in the free cash flows. Uh, represent the surplus that is available for distribution, whereas the dividend is the amount that is actually distributed. So, that is the fundamental difference between free cash flows and dividend. Dividend is the amount that is actually distributed by the company, free cash flow is the amount that is available for distribution. Now, if you are uh, looking at uh, the company as a potential takeover tar target or uh, evaluating the company from a uh, from an investor who is having a significant control over the company uh, over the affairs of the company then naturally it is the free cash flow that is the relevant parameter for determining the value of the company because then you are not concerned with the dividend decision. You can once you take over the company or because you have substantial say in the company, you can always impose your decision on the company in so far as the quantity and rate of dividend is concerned. So, your perspective should not depend on that particular decision, your perspective should depend on what is available on the basis of which you can take 
make a decision on what is to be distributed or not or if if anything at all is to be distributed so that is the difference between free cash flow and that is the reason that uh, when we talk about free cash flow based valuation we are doing the valuation uh, from the perspective of a person who is uh, who has a controlling interest in the company or who is proposing to take up a controlling interest in the company because he is not influenced by the dividend decision he can he can as and when he has that control if he has the control well and good if he does not have the control he has the ability on taking up a controlling stake to influence the decision of dividends or to influence the dividend decision. So, that dividend decision should not contribute to value in so far as the uh, interest of that controlling shareholder is concerned. So, that is important mm, uh, and of course, uh, the others are pretty much uh, obvious that if a firm does not pay dividends then you have to take recourse to free cash flows. If it does not have a consistent dividend payment record then you have to uh, take recourse to the free cash flow based methods. And of course, if, if the free cash flow uh, uh, tracks profitability relatively better than dividends do then again you should use the free cash flow based models. Now, this is the basic model, this is the uh, formula for the uh, for the intrinsic value of a stock uh, based on uh, dividend discounting. Uh, we discount the infinite stream of dividend obviously, uh, because we are talking about an infinite stream of dividend as uh, usual uh, as I mentioned in the introduction to equity analysis that we are now faced with the problem of having summations over uh, of an infinite set or infinite series. So, and that being the case, uh, we very often what we do is we split up the, the forecasting of cash flows into two parts. We do an explicit uh, forecasting uh, process uh, for an explicit for forecast period or a forecast period is um, which is explicitly done in terms of the the rates of dividend or the amounts of dividend and then we need we we work out a terminal value terminal value is based on the either on the based of the hypothetical or uh, uh, anticipated or expected price at the end of the forecast horizon or it may be based on a value that is a having or uh, that is worked out on the basis of a constant growth rate uh, uh, indefinitely. Uh, so, we split a uh, split in other words what we do is we split the infinite stream of, uh, of cash flows into two parts one explicitly forecasted cash flow stream uh, which is over a forecast horizon and then secondly uh, the remaining uh, cash flows are ascribed a certain value either based on a certain estimation of the value itself or based on a certain growth rate that is uh, uh, assumed to uh, exist indefinitely. So, uh, as, as a uh, growing annuity that is. So, that is how we do the valuation of, uh, uh, of uh, the intrinsic value of an equity share we divide it into two parts. Now, the explicit forecast period may again be divided into two parts or more than two parts. So, the basic thing is you see uh, you can have any kind of pattern that you feel appropriate to the exercise uh, being done. Uh, depending on the nature of the valuation, uh, nature of the stock being valued, nature of the company, the economic condition, or the projections for the economy, projections for that relevant industry, projections for the company and, and all these things. You can ascribe a certain pattern, uh, may be having a single, uh, single stage growth model or you may have a two stage growth model or a three stage growth model or an n stage growth model. Whatever the case may be, it really depends on the acumen and the understanding uh, of the analyst, how he perceives the future cash flows to be. But the important thing is that a certain pattern must be imputed to the cash flows because you are talking about a summation of an infinite stream. So, you, you cannot indefinitely go on forecasting that stream, it has to end somewhere. Uh, so, the point at which it ends as I mentioned, you have to take either a, a terminal value for that cash flow or you have to take a terminal growth rate on the basis of which the terminal value can be calculated. Some sir, assumption has to be made about the indefinite future behavior of cash flows, but for the finite period you can uh, uh, have explicit forecasting, you can forecast the dividends from year to 
year basis, you can forecast the dividend with a growth rate for the first n 1 years and a, a second growth rate for n 2 years, third growth rate for n 3 years and so on. So, th that freedom is always there to the analyst, but the important thing is um, at the end of the day we are summing up a geometric progression and uh, an infinite stream of cash flows. The discount rate here is the is the cost of equity as you can see here in this uh, formula and the another important thing is that uh, you start with the stream starts with the next cash flow. It, it is not from the current dividend, the current dividend is not relevant. The, you see when we, whenever we do a discounting exercise for calculating intrinsic value we are concerned with future cash flows, the discounting of future cash flows. So, when we talk about discounting of future cash flows, the first term that is relevant is the next dividend and not the previous dividend, not the current dividend. This is an important point that we keep, need to keep track of. Then and the, this is the simplest model that we have where we have only one growth rate uh, and uh, that growth rate is assumed to apply indefinitely over the life of the company. And this is called the Gordon growth model and uh, this ends up with a very simple formula which is given in the right hand side of the equation D 1 divided by K e minus G where G is the that constant growth rate. We are evaluating in this case, we are evaluating the dividend as a constant growth per perpetuity and uh, the at a rate K e and the growth rate uh, embedded in the perpetuity is G and on, on summing the geometric progression that we get, we get the formula D 1 upon K e minus G. So, this is the simplest model, the Gordon growth model. Uh, the P 0 is the current price, the intrinsic value, uh, uh, D 0 is the dividend that you have just received, D 1 is the dividend that you are going to receive in, in the end of period 1, uh, K e is the required rate of um, equity and G is the dividend growth rate. Uh, interpretation of K, K, e, K e is the expected return by equity shareholders. Now, the important thing that I want to mention here is that uh, at equilibrium the required rate by, uh, by a, a particular investor or a required rate by the market will be equal to the expected rate uh, on that security. Why is that? Because the price will adjust itself accordingly. For example, if the required rate by investors is higher, if the required rate by the the uh, collective wisdom of the market is higher and the expected rate of return is lower at a particular point in time from that particular security, then the price will uh, the demand for that uh, security will fall uh, uh, and as a result of which if the supply is constant. Uh, what will happen is because of the fall in demand the price will decrease and as a result of it the expected rate would increase and again at equilibrium the two rates would more or less uh, converge to each other. The required rate of return on a security would equal its if expected rate at equilibrium. Why the growth rate cannot uh, exceed K e? Well, uh, the mathematical reason is simple. If the growth rate exceeds uh, K e, then we have a divergent series and the formula that we used for arriving at a, at a value, at a finite value for the infinite stream of cash flows will not work. Recall that for an infinite geometric progression, uh, the sum of the cash flows uh, uh, in the sum of the infinite stream, uh, uh, infinite geometric progression uh, is given, uh, it, it converges or, or it takes a finite value only if the, uh, the common ratio is uh, less than 1. If the common ratio is greater than 1, the series diverges and you cannot have a finite sum for an, an infinite stream of uh, cash flows or any other thing uh, if, the, if the common ratio is greater than 1. So, in order that the common ratio be less than 1, we must have G must be less than K e. So, this is the mathematical reason. Uh, if G is greater than K e, we will not have a, a convergence uh, series uh, uh, and as a result of which we cannot arrive at a finite sum of that series. So, 
but as far as the economy is concerned, there is also some logic. If the growth rate exceeds the cost of capital or the cost of equity, then it, it, is, it is definitely prudent for the company to keep on reinvesting its resources to earn more and more profits, because you are, you are, uh, uh, the growth of your earnings is more than the, the, uh, the cost uh, that you are paying for um, retaining these funds. And as a result of this uh, indefinite and unprecedented continuous growth, what will happen is that the company will, will grow so much as to exceed that industry and uh, in fact encompass the entire economy as a whole, which is an absurd proposition. So, in real life we cannot have a situation where a company grows at a rate faster than the cost of equity of that company indefinitely. There may be small, please note the important point, there may be small periods, there may be say 3 years, 5 years, 10 years for which a company that has a patent or that has some kind of innovative uh, product uh, uh, that it has introduced into the market, it may grow at huge rates, it may grow at massive rates. But at the end of the day that those rates cannot continue indefinitely. That is the bottom line. The word indefinitely is most important, uh, it needs to be emphasized. Growth rates uh, exceeding for example, the normal inflation uh, and the and growth of the uh, economic parameters like the GDP and GNP ca cannot manifest themselves in any company indefinitely. For finite periods, yes, it can happen, but for, uh, for it to continue up to infinity, the company would enca encompass the entire economy and that is an absurd situation to, uh, to imagine. Then on the basis of our uh, uh, price valuation or intrinsic value valuation, we can arrive at justified leading and trailing P-E ratios, which are also usually calculated by the analysts. The leading price earning ratio is based on the earnings forecast for the next period and the trailing price earnings ratio is based on the previous or the Im immediately preceding earnings. So, I repeat the leading P E ratio worked out on the basis of the value calculations um, by discounting the DCF valuation uh, uses the earnings that are projected for the next period and the trailing P E ratio uh, is the uh, justified P E ratio rather is the P E ratio that is worked out on the basis of the DCF valuation and the immediately preceding. Um, um, earnings. So, the formula for the uh, justified leading P-E ratio and the justified trailing P-E ratio is given on this slide. It is quite simple. Uh, for the leading P-E ratio, we have P0 upon E1, where E1 is the projected earnings for the immediately following period and that is period 1 and when you simplify it, it becomes the payout ratio divided by K E minus G. And uh, for the trailing P ratio, it becomes the payout B is the retention ratio. So, 1 minus B is the payout ratio. So, 1 minus B is the payout ratio into 1 plus G divided by K E minus G. This is the trailing P ratio based on uh, or justified leading and justified trailing P ratios, which are based on the uh, uh, DCF valuations that we calculated. We will continue after the break. Thank you.